Welcome to the first of four panel discussions in the Innovate SoCal series from January 2014. This program includes moderator John Robinson, panelists Jim Joanasson, Elizabeth Stewart, and Lewis Stewart. Uh, it's great to be back here, and again, it's, it's uh, 19 degrees this morning in Kansas City. It's uh, probably 19 degrees Celsius uh, here, so, so um, it's, for a lot of reasons, it's great to be back. Um, and thank you to, uh, to Eloy and to Mayor Foster. Um, I wanted to talk very quickly a little bit about why Kaufman is here uh, at all, um, and why we're working with, with Long Beach City College and with community colleges uh, in general. Um, and, and to put it very simply, um, Kaufman uh, is, is strongly convinced of the idea that community colleges are and can be a front door to entrepreneurship uh, and, a, and a valuable contributor to the innovation economy in communities all around the country. Um, and why we're here in Long Beach, well, there's a couple of good reasons for that. But Absolutely the most important is uh, in doing the work that we want to do in, in supporting entrepreneurs through education and access to capital and, and mentorship. Um, we need uh, bold partners uh, at the community colleges that we work with. Um, it's about progressive leadership. Uh, it's about uh, presidents and, and, and their senior staff that, that uh, take an expansive vision of, of what's possible at a community college. And uh, uh, we have definitely found that in Eloy and, uh, and his team at Long Beach City College. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was talking um, last night at dinner um, with uh, one of the trustees of, of the college, Doug Otto. Um, who said that every college, uh, at least in California, has these three missions um, to, uh, to be focused on student success, student completion, and, and, and access to, to college, to, you know, democracy's college, um, to be committed to workforce development, and to be committed to, to economic development. And that's a theme that we hear uh, 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 repeated all over the country, but it's, it's rare, to be honest, to find a school that is genuinely and in a really meaningful way committed to, um, to economic development, to that third piece. And, and we see uh, evidence ample evidence at Long Beach City College. So that's why we found such a great partner here. Um, and we've seen such great work being done with 10,000 small businesses, uh, with the, the work of the, uh, the SBDC here. And, um, and now uh, we're very excited to be working with them on, on Innovation Fund SoCal. Um, so what we're, what we're going to talk about, I guess I should bring the, the other panelists up now, or are we going to are you going to announce them too, or is, you want me to do that? Okay, all right, I can do that. Um, why don't we just ask them to come up, and I'll, um, I'll uh, introduce them um, in a second here. But we're going to be talking about, uh, I think the title is Casting a Wider Net. Uh, effectively, what this is about, though, is, is democratizing the, the process of, uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, democratizing access to the resources that make entrepreneurs successful. Um, and uh, it's about uh, inclusiveness. Um, it's about increasing the participation rates from uh, certain demographic and, and geographic groups that are underrepresented. It's changing this idea that innovation and, and high growth, uh, scalable entrepreneurship only happens in um, that place that I'm not allowed to say anymore, thanks, Ted, um, up north from here on the coast. Uh, kind of. um, that, uh, that innovation uh, really does happen everywhere. And I think we're going to see evidence of that in spades as we get into our conversation here. Uh, um, but very quickly, I think you know, there's a couple of reasons why this is important. Um, we are, uh, it wouldn't seem like it, uh, based on what we, what we look at when we, when we read about uh, um, Silicon Valley. Oh, there. Said it. Uh, Silicon Valley and, and reading TechCrunch and whatnot, that, that um, you know, anybody with $100,000 in a spreadsheet, anybody with a spreadsheet can raise $100,000 in Silicon Valley. But, um, but we do know that um, uh, the venture capital uh, has declined from $104 billion in, um, in the, uh, the, the you know, early 2000s to uh, about $19 billion um, a couple of years ago. And with the Series A crunch, um, in which the number of A rounds has not kept pace with the, um, with, with the seed dollars awarded out. Um, it's, it's lean times in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and 
that even takes into account the fact that um, it's a lot less expensive to, to start these days. But um, given that there is a, the pie has gotten smaller, the fact that some of these numbers around uh, minority participation in, um, in, 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 in entrepreneurship, uh, the participation of, of women, uh, uh, female founders in entrepreneurship, um, and, and the fact that a lot of venture capital dollars don't leave the uh, you know, uh, headquarters, uh, uh, whether it be Sand Hill Road or whether it be Union Square or North Brooklyn in New York or um, uh, Boston, Route 128, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to be very proactive in casting this wider net, into understanding that we can find uh, great deals everywhere, uh, that we really need to work much harder to incentivize broader participation in the entrepreneurial experience. Um, so with that, um, I, I'll consider the stage set uh, for our conversation, and I'll do a quick introduction of everybody here. Um, uh, Jim Janassen uh, founded JJA Venture Search in 2007. Jim brings a rare blend of experience, having led well over 500 searches in his career, but also founded and built two successful software companies. Previously, Jim co-founded Riviera Partners, a search and placement firm, in 2001. Uh, prior to Riviera, Jim was Senior Vice President and General Manager of Application and Procurement Services at Opus 360 Corporation, which was acquired by Artemis International. Jim co-founded and was chairman and CEO of People Mover Inc., uh, which completed its merger with Opus 360 in February of 2000. Uh, Lewis Stewart uh, currently serves as the deputy director of innovation and entrepreneurship in the governor's office of business and economic development, uh, Go Biz, uh, where he oversees the coordination and promotion of innovative programs, activities, and emerging technologies throughout the state of California. At GoBiz, Mr. Stewart manages a robust statewide innovation-based economic development support network of regional innovation clusters called the California Innovation Hubs, or iHubs. The 16 iHubs were designed to stimulate local, regional, and statewide job creation, as well as enhance the awareness, visibility, and opportunities for commercialization of the technologies emerging from GoHub, uh, Go, uh, from GoBiz iHub partners. Prior to GoBiz, Mr. Stewart served as the Deputy Director of the two, for the 2010 Census in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, overseeing and directing the statewide new media outreach and county coordination for the U.S. decennial census in uh, 2010 in California. Mr. Stewart comes from the private sector, where he has 17 years of experience in sales, marketing, and IT. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Santa Clara University. Uh, Elizabeth Stewart, who I don't think is related to or married to Mr. Stewart, um, <laughs> is the uh, co-founder and managing partner of Hub LA, uh, a co-working space, accelerator, uh, innovation lab, and community center for social impact ventures in downtown LA. For the last 10 years, Elizabeth has worked on environmental and social sustainability with a particular emphasis on water, energy, and social enterprise models. Elizabeth is the founding director of Cosmopolis, a collaborative firm focused on developing infrastructure that furthers the integration of environmental, social, and economic considerations to create vibrant urban, urban places worldwide. She's also advised clean tech and community-oriented technology startups. Prior to starting Cosmopolis, the majority of her career has been spent working in nonprofit management and international development, developing holistic and sustainable water and sanitation programs alongside small businesses, and has worked on sustainable economic development, analyzing the impact of recent green manufacturing and green building trends on jobs, uh, small businesses, and urban sustainability here in LA. Uh, Elizabeth holds an MA in urban planning from the University of California, LA, and a BA in political science. So what I'd like to do is uh, ask the panelists to speak for a few minutes to kind of put some context around this question and uh, lay the foundation for our conversation. Um, and perhaps I'll ask uh, Lewis to start. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm not related to Elizabeth, uh, and I'm honored to be up here with a male model. Uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, I, I figured out that I got to step up my sock game looking at his right now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have the, the fortune of, of working for uh, two administrations now, uh, overseeing innovation and entrepreneurship for the state. Uh, currently under uh, Jerry Brown, the program I oversee called the iHubs was codified, uh, which means now I, I actually have a real program that I oversee versus just something that I run around the state talking about. Uh, it is uh, 16 uh, hubs around the state uh, from Reading down to, to San Diego. Uh, focus on everything from ag to water to energy 
uh, biotech, high tech, uh, aerospace, uh, healthcare, you name it. So every day is, is a new day for me and, and quite enjoyable. Uh, around what, uh, what John was talking about earlier as far as the diversification of, of uh, innovation entrepreneurship in the state. Uh, a lot of times when I go to events, uh, I, you know, as, as far as if you look at color, uh, it's typically just me. Uh, so I, I show up in a room and, and it's not very diverse. Uh, so I was very intrigued uh, by this topic uh, because a lot of what I'm working on to instill within the innovation hubs is, is actually extending into the community uh, and finding the, the hard to reach areas, uh, finding the underserved uh, areas in the, in the community that they can actually start uh, bringing in the, the knowledge base that's there and introducing uh, kids uh, from you know K through 12 uh, into uh, innovation, into high tech, into whatever it is that's going on in the community and, and really working on, on uh, fostering the ideas and, and innovation that, that exists. Uh, most recently, uh, I was at um, uh, Pantheon Awards uh, that Bay Bio up in Silicon Valley, but San Francisco. Uh, and uh, you know, sitting there with a bunch of doctors, sitting there with a bunch of scientists, and all of a sudden, uh, rap music starts, and I, I get excited. I'm trying not to dance in my seat. And uh, it's these uh, four kids uh, rapping about uh, the, the two scientists that, that found DNA. And uh, it was uh, a rap battle. Uh, so they actually, uh, uh, Watson and Crick versus Rosalind Franklin, who actually discovered DNA first. It was the most brilliant thing I'd seen in a long, long time. And I actually spent the next day trying to find other rap battle competitions. And there's only one other one out in New York. So. Uh, my new my new thing is to try to figure out how to get an East Coast versus West Coast rap battle going on around <laughs> science. So. <laughs> so. That's great. Um, hi, I'm uh, Elizabeth Stewart, and uh, I'm just also really excited to be on this panel today. Thank you. Um, I think that this is a unique gathering and conversation, and I'm ec excited about integrating uh, the thought of triple bottom line businesses and. Um, democratizing access to the tools and resources that we need to diversify the base of entrepreneurs in, in this country. So I'm, it, it's a unique, I think, um, gathering in that there's a lot of entrepreneurial gatherings and um, a lot of tech and VC um, networking going on. But with this particular aspect of the conversation, it's, it's really refreshing. So thank you for taking a lead you know, in, in integrating this part of the conversation. Um, Hub Los Angeles uh, is a passion that grew out of uh, landing in London, working on ethical fashion and supply chain management, and meeting a whole host of diverse thinkers and entrepreneurs that were pursuing um, new business initiatives, but in a way that incorporated environmental or social um, elements. So triple bottom line businesses, social entrepreneurship. And I, I landed in London and uh, found myself working out of the first hub and was inspired by this, uh, what felt like a, a campus, essentially, with a diverse group of people, um, all kind of collaborating, working on their own initiatives. But definitely, they didn't feel alone. Um, they felt like they had camaraderie and solidarity with other folks that were really pushing the envelope in new models uh, to, create, to create change through entrepreneurship. And I came back to Los Angeles. I was in grad school at the time and uh, started talking to some folks about the collaborative economy, the sharing economy through space and how we could use space to sort of fuel um, uh, you know, the, the thinking power that often happens just on college campuses around the country. How does that look when you get out of college? How can we have a second and third and fourth um, campus-like or college experience out in the world? And really what we um, embarked on creating was a sort of a social professional club at the end of the day. When you, when you look at it, you get access to space. You get access to community. Um, we have social events. But the layers of what is possible with a diverse membership base, so we have about 230 members. We've been open for a year and a half, and we have 8,000 square feet of space in downtown Los Angeles, uh, which is a growing hub um, where a lot of people are coming through and cross-pollinating. It's, you know, the vibrancy is coming back in downtown. We're in the arts district. And what we've found is by clustering, 
a lot of talk about clustering and like a micro hyper cluster of individuals that are working across tech and development and consulting and also cons a whole host of members that consider themselves social entrepreneurs, um, people are starting to collaborate and resource each other in a way that uh, isn't necessarily happening if we just had entrepreneurs or if we just had one industry represented. Um, the bigger picture of Hub LA and the social mission that we're going after is how do we drive social innovation uh, forward? And we believe that it first and foremost starts with a diverse cross-section of industry, skill sets, and demographics. And then we're playing host, which is a really important component to this, because just gathering people in space isn't necessarily going to get this done. But we're playing host and facilitator and matchmaker across this whole community at Hub LA. And we're doing it, the economic model is through a membership, uh, membership model. So that's, that's kind of how um, we're putting together some of these pieces to experiment and see what's possible. Um, we're running programs right now that look like accelerators, but they're through a membership base. So it's almost that, you know, again, you arrive on the campus of Hub LA, if you will, as a member, and you have access to office hours of other members and other experts. You have workshops, you can attend social events, um, and you can you know, basically come and meet with our team to find the resources that you need out in the community or within the community. So this is the model that we're testing out. There's actually 40 hubs around the world, so we're also connected to uh, a global network of these places. And uh, coming from an urban planning background, my, my interest was in placemaking and economic development and how do the two go hand in hand. Um, so as, as much as you know, we're operating in a very virtual, virtual world these days, uh, you know, the impact of having people gather in space and then connect through tools online, I think, um, has really uh, proven itself already in the, in the year and a half that we've been uh, going, where people are, are um, basically furthering their businesses and growing. Um, and we have several success stories. We actually have quite a few members uh, here in the room today, which is exciting too. Um, so I'll leave it at that in terms of what we're up to at Hub, Hub Los Angeles. Very cool. Um, I think that the, uh, the, the metaphor, cast a wider net, I, th I think maybe is the wrong metaphor. I think the metaphor is a mining metaphor. And ultimately, you've got to go to the place where the gold is to mine, mine for it. So rather than waiting for the net to kind of cast wider and come and get you, you got to go find it. Hub is an absolute place where there are veins of unbelievable value and resources and the programs that, uh, uh, that the state is putting on are, that, that, that Long Beach uh, City College and, and Innovate SoCal, just amazing. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a headhunter. I'm a career headhunter. I've been doing it for 30 years since I moved to California in the early 80s. Um, I've also I've started four uh, executive search firms and three software companies. Um, I'm really part now of the professional services ecosystem in the west side of Los Angeles and Santa Monica that helps to foster and grow the tech and digital and media companies that are there that are just exploding. Uh, from, the, from the time when I, I left as a, my last uh, tour of duty as a software CEO in 2000, uh, between 2001 and 2000, the end of 2006, I had to go up to Palo Alto um, for more than half my time because there just wasn't enough here going on in the mine called Southern California, and I had to go find the work. So we went up there, we worked with a lot of the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, really honed our craft, moved my two partners up there. Uh, but at the end of 06, beginning of 07, I saw that there was finally enough here, uh, enough centers of excellence and enough, um, uh, enough areas where there were blooming uh, you know, companies and ecosystems of, of, uh, of startups. So came back down, sold that firm, um, and since that time I've been focused in Santa Monica. Santa Monica is a place where we have more incubators, accelerators, and co-work spaces than Starbucks coffee shops. Uh, it's amazing how many resources that have developed there uh, and how much talent has come there, how much capital has come there, how much innovation has come there. So I'd say it's kind of right up the block and uh, Culver City is the same way. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate over the last decade to work with some of the amazing explosive companies here in Southern California that are from all around uh, the Southern California area. Give you some, give you some examples. Higher Right, based in Irvine, a company that uh, I like to stay that we started working with them when they couldn't get arrested. 
Uh, they went public. They were then acquired by a private equity firm. Reach Local in Woodland Hills. I remember the, the first meeting I had in the early 2000s with the uh, two founders. They've gone public. Now the founders just left. The two founders just left to create a new company. So another one of those uh, opportunities for serial entrepreneurs to keep going. Green Dot, company in Monrovia, banking the unbanked with uh, uh, innovative financial services. Real D, a company in Beverly Hills that puts the 3D technology into the theaters that you go into. The company went public about four years ago. Latest IPO was Cornerstone On Demand in Santa Monica, the fastest growing software as a service company in the world. Uh, they just announced their own incubator and accelerator and venture fund to create innovative new startups in the area. Uh, some of the next ones that you're going to hear about are companies like the Rubicon Project in West Los Angeles uh, that has filed its S1 to go public. They're an ad tech platform for serving ads out onto the internet and mobile. OpenX uh, is another company in Pasadena, 350 employees. Again, I remember when it was one of those garage startups. A company in El Segundo called Velocify, formerly known as Leeds 360, and there's a fellow named Jeff Solomon who's going to be on the next panel who's one of the founders of Leeds 360 and Velocify. So there's an, an unbelievable amount of, of uh, activity that's going on, but it's in pockets that, you know, that kind of aren't centralized. When I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley versus LA, the difference that I found was there was no Palo Alto. There was no single center. When I was in Palo Alto, I could make a telephone call to someone east of Pleasanton uh, or south of San Jose and say, let's have coffee tomorrow in Palo Alto, and they'd say, what time? Here, we talk about coming from Orange County to LA, and it's like a field trip. I mean, we can't do that. I got to rearrange my whole schedule. So, you know, I think we are, we are much more dispersed, but we've got to kind of, we, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to go where the action is, and we've got to kind of support those things. Um, uh, I'd hope that Metrolink would help. I'm not sure that it has. I think it's fantastic that you're downtown, uh, where the Metrolink can bring in talent from Pasadena and Irvine and all parts in between. So uh, there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. Um, we've, we've, been a, we've been around to see some revolutions. Uh, a revolution in product development between open source, op open source software and cloud-based services like Amazon Web Services, agile and scrum-based rapid development of products so you can start these companies much more uh, cheaply. Uh, marketing and customer acquisition, there's a center of excellence in Southern California around customer acquisition, online marketing, uh, digital analytics around all the ways that companies get revenue and find customers. Uh, there's been revolutions in funding, crowdsourcing of funding. The Jobs Act has opened up and, and enabled any investor to write a check for $1.50 or, or $100,000 to invest in a startup with things like Kickstarter and Crowdsourcer. So I'm pretty excited about what's, what's going on, and I think the entrepreneurs and the companies need to get to where the talent and the capital and the action is, again, to those kind of areas in the mine. So glad to be here, and uh, we'll have fun. Well, thank you all for, um, for getting us started. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and maybe those will create other questions and whatnot, but then, um, then we will open it up to, uh, to audience participation. Uh, and by participation, I mean questions, not sermons. Um, so start thinking about um, what you would like to ask our esteemed panelists, um, but I'll go first. Um, I, I'd like to maybe prompt Lewis to talk a little bit about the selection process uh, for the iHubs program because sure. there are 16, is that right, 16 yes. iHubs in the state um, and they are not all you know, zip codes in the Bay Area. No. <laughs> you know, so um, they are really, if you look at the map, and I, and I did uh, just this morning, um, they are really spread across the state and you know, inland and, and up north, looks like around Davis and in toward Riverside and, and kind of all over. And yeah. you can talk a little bit about uh, where, where they are and what they're doing, but also the process by which you determined that, that um, there was innovation happening quite literally everywhere in the state. Sure, sure. So as, as John was saying, the, the iHubs, based, you know, I, when I describe it to international audience, this is about, it's about 700 miles uh, that, that uh, the iHubs encompass. So like I said, from Reading down to San Diego. The program started back, back in 2010 with just the idea of, of getting clusters of, of people together uh, and really centered around university, government, and industry uh, working together to create jobs. Uh, in innovation, a lot of job creation is, is long term. It's not the short pop. 
uh, you may get you may get some stuff with with uh, the the startup community where where you know a company goes IPO and all of a sudden they just grow. But a lot of times it's it's really working on workforce development, working on on uh, the talent pipeline, working on access to capital and all those things. But with iHubs, it was really the triple helix. It was is how do you get those three communities to to actually work together and and do a public good. Um, so the the process um, is is really uh, kind of open. Uh, Right now, all the innovation hubs are completely self-funded. Uh, their regions are completely self-defined. Uh, they actually apply to the state uh, with what they believe their, their innovation uh, uh, focus is um, and what their region is. Uh, so if it's a, a counties, if it's a kind of, well, we try not to do a city base because we like it to be regional so that you can actually get the, the true diversity of, of what's going on in the area. Uh, and they apply uh, through an uh, application process. We've had three rounds so far, um, and they apply uh, to uh, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. We actually have a, a review panel that we pull together, a 17-member review committee uh, that spans the, the helix, right? So you have some industry folks, you have some university folks, you have some, some state officials, uh, you have some you know, some industry folks, and and they they do all the review. Uh, and once the review is done, they recommend what they believe uh, will be a successful innovation cluster for the region. Uh, and then basically, GoBiz takes that recommendation and and uh, gives the designation of an innovation hub. Uh, so that's why you see the diversity. We you know we may put out hints that uh, we're looking for a certain area. But it doesn't preclude uh, somebody from from applying with an area that's already uh, that's ar that's already covered. So if, if somebody wanted to come in with bio, you know, technically we have two bio uh, I hubs. We have uh, San Diego, we have uh, San Francisco. Uh, but we've been undergoing efforts with those guys to actually diversify what what their mix is. So now San Francisco um, has expanded from the bio SF to San Francisco uh, I hub, and it covers everything from bio to fashion to high tech. Uh, the, the manufacturing SF made economy, uh, sharing economy up there. Um, and uh, we actually have uh, Jim Watson here from, from one of the newer iHubs uh, for CNMI, which is a statewide iHub. So that's the first one that actually covers the entire state. And it's the California Network for Manufacturing Innovation. And it's really looking at uh, how do we keep California number one uh, in manufacturing as a state. Uh, how do we keep uh, uh, the job creation? How do we develop the workforce of the future? Uh, for manufacturing, um, and that's advanced manufacturing and traditional manufacturing. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, self-designated, self-funded. Uh, there's an application process. It's a review committee uh, that actually goes through. So, so we, you know, we, we put it in the hands of, of the committee, um, and then we go from there. But everybody's open to apply. Uh, regional partnerships is kind of the big thing. Um. I'd like to, to shift gears um, a second here and, and go back to this question around um, inclusion or in inclusiveness uh, within the entrepreneurial community. Um, and, and this, if you're paying attention, this is something that, that you know is no um, any great revelation that um, that uh, uh, the, the, the face of the entrepreneur, the, you know, the public face of the entrepreneur, is um, is pretty lily white, um, pretty male, and. Uh, the data backs that up that you know uh, minority entrepreneurs make up um, about eight percent of those who pitch uh, uh, angel investors um, with a success rate of around fifteen percent and that's below the twenty two percent that um, that businesses as a total uh, uh, the success rate of, of businesses as a total pitching angels um, similarly um, you know only eighteen percent of angel investors are women um, and within the VC community it's it's less than ten percent at the partner level um, eight percent of, of startup founders are, are women, um, uh, and it's not just about the, the founders themselves too. In terms of looking at talent, uh, the number of computer science degrees, as one example, uh, awarded to women, has declined by nearly fifty percent over the past twenty years, according to the NSF. So, um, my question, uh, setting a good example for all of you that will follow, um, my question is. Uh, who, who bears the burden of improving inclusiveness? Um, is it the funding and investment community? Uh, is it local, uh, state, and, 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 uh, and federal government? Uh, educators, uh, the entrepreneurs themselves, and would-be entrepreneurs? 
uh, themselves and, and what, what are the levers that we can pull? What are the actions that we can take to improve that inclusiveness? And, uh, and also, are there local examples here that, that we can spotlight? And I'll address that question to really anybody who wants to, to start us off. All right, I'll <laughs> start with some thinking. Um, I, you know, it, it is a, it is very central to the hub globally, the hub's mission um, to diversify and democratize access to resources. So that's a, a core tenant in in what these places are trying to do, and what us as founders of hubs locally around the world are trying to accomplish. Uh, we, my role at the hub um, and in the community is a lot of uh, matchmaking and inter intermediation uh, between access to capital and the entrepreneurs that, that we're working with, our members. And I think a lot about intention and the intention of capital. Um, capital's a tool and it usually is connected to the intention of the individuals that um, you know, use it as a resource. So I think that in terms of who bears the burden or who, um, you know, it's an interesting question. I think at the moment, the capital that really should be furthering this, I believe, are, is the foundation community and uh, the government uh, community in terms of uh, the capital intentions. Um, I think that's where we can expect and sort of keep the dialogue going about how we unleash capital into this, this space. Um, we are working a lot on uh, impact investing as a, a topic in Los Angeles. So I sit on the board of Advisors in Philanthropy and we're doing an event, a second event ever in Los Angeles around impact investing. And it's a growing community, it's a growing dialogue, um, but folks that are looking for triple bottom line and social returns alongside financial returns, that type of capital uh, needs to expand because I think that a lot of the, the um, entrepreneurs of color and the, the folks that are starting small businesses and creating jobs, you, you see opportunities from the experience that you have and from where you come from. So finding market opportunities is often connected to your own personal experiences and, and ideas for, for new businesses and new models. So I think that uh, you know, we can't underestimate the need for capital that's specifically dedicated to female and to, to uh, entrepreneurs of color. So to seek that capital out, I think it absolutely has to start with the foundation community and, and government resources to get that ball rolling um, because it, it, it does have to be jump started in some way. You know, the, the other thing that I was thinking about actually on my way here is the recirculation of capital. We talk about these serial entrepreneurs and often they become VCs and they keep these, these cycles going, um, and it, which is what we've you know, seen in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have a lot of philanthropists. Uh, in communities in South LA and East LA that, that come from the sports industries um, and reinvest in the communities in these places. And if we can start to take some of that capital and, and shift it from just pure philanthropic or grant making into a hybrid space of investment, um, I think it could really start to, to change sort of the patterns uh, that we're seeing. So if, if I could add on to what Elizabeth is saying, I think uh I, I will admit that government probably has a little bit uh, to, to, to do with this, but uh, not necessarily just because of, of where budget cycles go and, and you know how deficits go. Uh, I don't know on the capital side, uh, but I think the government definitely can start sending political signals uh, to industry uh, about the strength of the economy and, and what's important uh, for the growth of the economy. Uh, and you know, getting getting uh, women and, and minorities involved in innovation entrepreneurship, so they can actually start successful businesses and, and thrive and succeed with the new ideas uh, going on in the innovation economy. So, so I think uh, through the work that uh, that that we do at GoBiz, uh, in partnership with the foundations, in partnership with community colleges, in partnership with the workforce investment boards, in partnership with industry, uh, the corporate social responsibility uh, folks. Uh, and really, really uh, folks outside of, of government being willing to talk to government when government approaches them uh, and says that we're, we're here to help. Uh, oftentimes when I walk into a room and say that, people laugh at me uh, and, and they don't take me seriously. Uh, one, because I'm not coming with a check in my hand, uh, but I am coming with access to, you know, if you look at 
just the Innovation Hub Network. I'm, I'm coming with access to 700 miles of, of innovators and entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm coming with access to the national labs. I'm coming with access to, to Navy and Army bases up and down the state. I can talk to you about UAVs. I can talk to you about 3D manufacturing. I can talk to you about ag. I can talk to you about whatever. And so now it's about exposure. Uh, how do we get uh, women, women and, and minorities exposed to all this technology and all this great stuff that's happening? How does the government send signals that uh, while, while we don't support uh, the, the drones for military usage, but we can actually support drones for, for combating fires? Uh, we can support drones for, for uh, ag, ag, um, uh, ag uses. Uh, but then also talking to, to on the commercialization side to the Navy bases, to, to the, the labs, and seeing what great stuff that the scientists and, and techs, which the average age is typically about 50, uh, how do we get what's in their minds and translate it down to, to the K through 12 folks so they understand that there's a future uh, in science and technology and engineering, um, and and just expose them. You know, I, was, I was at uh, uh, China China Lake and they showed me some of the great stuff that they're doing. Um, and in my head, uh, I was inspired, and I, I started thinking of all the different connections and all the different people that I'd like to get down to China Lake just to expose them to what I saw. Uh, so I'm, I you know, went back up to Sacramento, uh, started talking to some of the community folks, the foundations, whatever. Uh, how do we get high school kids uh, exposed to what's going on at the labs and at China Lake? Uh, and so far, uh, nobody's been interested because I'm not coming with a check. Um, and so, so I think, you know, when, when Dr. Zoller was talking about the community, it really does take a community uh, to make any of this stuff happen and to change it. Uh, I don't think the responsibility really sits on one person, uh, but everybody has to be willing to collaborate to compete in order to change what's actually happening. So. I, I would say that um, the statistics that John mentioned are kind of astonishing, kind of embarrassing, but they're real. And what I've seen in this world of startups is Startups are really hard. 99% of them fail. And what the best investors find out is they take the unfair advantage of getting engineers from elite schools, uh, people from elite business schools where they have incredibly powerful networks, um, brands and companies that have spawned other companies. Those are unfair advantages. And the job of those investors, those deal makers, is to mitigate risk. And they will mitigate risk constantly. So that's a reality, you gotta deal with it. The other reality, and I'll tell you this from firsthand knowledge from recruiting for these companies and building management teams for 30 years is, they are colorblind, they have no gender bias, they are looking for skills. And if the individuals bring the skills, they will be, they will be hired, they will be retained, they will be bonused, and they will be incentivized unbelievably. I have clients where I walk into the, to the offices and they're like the United Nations, unbelievably diverse. I have clients that constantly ask for me. They say 90% of the buying that goes on on the internet and on mobile is done by women. Please help us to find some women come in here to run branding or run marketing or run sales or run the company. We want them at the table. We want, their, uh, we want their purview, but it's up to the individual. And I think it's going to be a generational thing that's going to change over time. The facts are real, and I don't think it's kind of one group or one foundation or one government or education. I think it's got to come you know, from the individuals that are going to go out and seek those, those opportunities and get to kind of the places where the feeders into these startups, and again, I'm speaking primarily from technology, but where, they, you know, where those things emanate and where that risk gets lowered. All right, well, we've got some time to uh, turn it over if there are uh, questions from the audience, and I can't really see, but I think that there are microphones out there, um, and uh, feel free to approach one if you so desire, yeah. and if you could announce yourself and where you're from and all that. Uh, John Kelsall with the uh, Jonas Project. Elizabeth, you mentioned the triple bottom line. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I absolutely can. Um, yeah, I should have explained a little bit more of that term. Um, so it's, it's businesses that are taking into account the environment, social outcomes, um, and people, along with profit. So the three, you know, the three that we're talking about are people, planet, profit. So businesses that uh, might be traditional businesses like apparel companies or fashion companies that are deciding to manufacture in an environmentally sustainable way, use organic cottons, care about their supply chain, maybe have 
uh, specific hiring practices in the local community. So businesses can be traditional and, you know, and then they can also be what we call social entrepreneurial. So first and foremost, they're looking at a social cause and applying business principles or business models uh, to solve a social problem. So Isidore Electronics uh, is a company that got founded out of the, the, the cause around recidivism, reducing recidivism rates in uh, Los Angeles, and she paired that job kind of trajectory for individuals coming out of uh, prison with the recycling, the electronics recycling industry that's a growing industry in Los Angeles, and that is a fit that happens to address both some social and also has a sustainable business model linked to what she's doing. So we're really looking for the next generation of businesses that aren't just concerned only about profits, but also are taking into account people and planet, because we believe that the next wave of innovation has to be social innovation and has to um, include these elements in terms of how we do business going forward. So that's really what the focus is of, of hubs around the world, is how do we drive and generate this new kind of uh, economy that takes into account these things. I'll give you a couple local examples. I never heard of a triple bottom line. I'd heard of a double bottom yep, line. Exactly, double yeah. bottom line being do well and do good. Um, here in Los Angeles, I have two clients. One of them is called Participant Media. Yes. Participant Media is owned by Jeff Skoll, who was one of the founders of PayPal and has more money than God. And uh, they have a movie studio, two cable television networks, and a, and a digital outlet. Uh, and they've brought you films like Lincoln and The Help and Waiting for Superman. And they're constantly looking at changing the world around five or six key areas. Another one is a West Los Angeles-based company called Saber es Poder, uh, Spanish for knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And they exist in the, um, most of the Latin American and Mexican embassies where people spend five and six hours and they provide information on English as a second language classes and how to get a resume done and how to get insurance and things like that. So there are, probably the most famous one is in West Los Angeles uh, called Tom, Tom Shoes, who are all pretty, pretty well, well aware of. They have what they call a one and one model. For every pair of shoes they sell, they give a pair of shoes to a, a child in an area where, where they're, uh, where they're uh, obviously don't have the same kind of opportunities, so. Great. Uh, or ma'am, you wanna go? Um, so if we're interested in the hubs and resources that you're talking about, how do we find out more about that? So uh, for, for me, um, you know, you guys can, can go to uh, the, the GoBiz website, or you can hit me on Twitter, or you can, uh, you know, see me afterwards, I'll give you my direct number. But uh, the, the, the Innovation Hub program is, is all listed on our, our, on our website, business.ca.gov, um, and then just look for the Innovation tab, and, uh, and everything for the hubs is there. Um, you know, just, just to let you guys know, um, there probably won't be another round uh, for a while because we have to do regulations, we have to do some other stuff since the bill's passed. Uh, but getting involved in some of the some of the stuff that the 16 are doing is actually quite easy. Um, so so we can definitely get you guys connected that way. Uh, yeah, we we have a website uh, that talks about kind of what we're up to. Uh, we're just getting ready to update it. We we are completely privately um, resourced, so we raised investment capital to open from some individuals in Los Angeles that believe in this sort of social mission alongside uh, uh, entrepreneurship. And we are a community, first and foremost, so it takes a community to resource itself, and so that's what we're building. So it's, it's not, it's uh, very participatory in nature in terms of the individuals and members that are coming. We're sharing each other, you know, sharing their skills with, e with one another. Um, so it's really critical to, for the hub, to come into the community as a participant versus just someone that is looking to, um, you know, just access resources. So that's kind of the way we're sustaining and growing ourselves. So if that's, um, if you have something to offer, you will get something out of it as well, and we can plug you into resources within the hub and also externally. I would say fire up Google and uh, around Los Angeles, every night of the week there are multiple meetups and. Yeah hackathons and coffees and cocktails and keggers and all kinds of things going on in the co-work spaces and the incubators, the accelerators, uh, and in several organizations. There's an entrepreneur named uh, Jason Nazar who every uh, month or so has an event called Startups Uncensored and they do it at the uh, Miramar Sheraton in Santa, or Miramar 
Fairmont, whatever it is, in Santa Monica. They get four, five, six hundred people a night. And it's a phenomenal on-ramp to the entrepreneurial world. So you got to get out and you got to go mix it up and you got to go meet people and do a little bit of that networking. And I would say that for, uh, for the things that we've talked about on this panel and for everything else that we talk about for the rest of the day, I would reiterate what I said at the outset of this, which is that uh, Long Beach City College is your front door to, uh, to entrepreneurship, your point of entry into all of this. And I know that uh, Shenny Weber and Jesse Torres and all of their team uh, would be more than happy to handle all of your inquiries, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sir, in the hat. I'm in agreement. That is the self thing, meaning um, I'm responsible for me. I um, have a question. Does anybody here know of programs that can teach youth personal leadership? Before you get to college, you got to get to college, and you've got to deal with issues in your own community, and you also have to deal with the issues within your own immediate self. We train you to teach them that an entrepreneur is an individual that takes calculated risk for private profit. Inner city you don't even know what that means. They're so tired to so much technology that they're not even having real relationships. So does anybody here have a recommendation, an idea, a resource that we can utilize to help develop personal leadership. Boys and Girls Clubs. We help to, we help to sponsor the uh, Boys and Girls Club of Venice and Santa Monica in their programs for media technology and leaders in training. They're phenomenal programs. They're open to any kid. I would say, I don't know about the local Boys and Girls Club here, but you know, the, the, they've, they've now taken, uh, the Santa Monica Boys and Girls Club has now 13 campuses. They put media technology centers in most of them. They have leaders in training programs. They're phenomenal programs available to youth. So we also sponsor a, uh, an organization called City Year Los Angeles, which puts mentors into the, into the middle schools that feed the dropout factory high schools to try to get kids more excited about education. But uh, Boys and Girls Club is a great resource. There's, there's also, uh... SJLI, Social Justice Learning Institute, uh, that D'Artagnan Scorza heads up. Uh, that's in a lot of high schools in South LA and is expanding to East LA. There's La Causa, which is headed, uh, founded by Robert Zardineta. They're also doing a lot with youth uh, leadership and tracks into UCLA and, and the regional sort of colleges. Uh, and the other one is Youth Speaks uh, Media Solutions or Youth Speak. Um, which is out of Pacoima, which is also doing a lot of youth leadership training um, as well. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of City Year. Uh, I got exposed to them up in Sacramento, uh, and uh, I, I love what they do because they actually use uh, use um, peer groups to, to actually go back down and teach in the middle school, and and they, they focus really on seventh, eighth, and ninth grade uh, as far as mentoring and, and try to get them through high school and then back out, and that's a virtual cycle. So I'd, I'd like a City Year. So. Last question, sir. Hello, I'm uh, Blake Christian. Thank you for your great content. Uh, this is a question for, uh, for Mr. Stewart, I believe. Um, can you just describe to the audience uh, how the GoBiz system will work, which will be really important, you know, with us having the highest tax rates in the country and the elimination of the Enterprise Zone program? Maybe how they can uh, negotiate some of those and kind of what the, the profile of the businesses that can access those uh, tax incentives. So yeah, the the uh, the governor's economic development package is a, it's a much broader conversation than, than we have time for today, uh, but I can absolutely tell you that uh, that looking at uh, the package that was laid out last year, uh, late last year, uh, you're looking at hiring tax credits, you're looking at uh, sales and use tax credits, um, you're looking at uh, uh, the California Competes program that actually. Uh, looks at income tax credits uh, to help businesses compete in California. So there's, there's, there's that avenue that's, that's rolling in. It started uh, January 1st and the second part rolls out in July. Uh, but we're, we're kind of reorganizing uh, how we're able to compete for, for business against some of our major competitors. Uh, not necessarily South Dakota, uh, but uh, some of the other ones that, that uh, we hear about all the time. Uh, but we can talk offline uh, a little bit about that uh, if you want. 
All right, I've been told we have time for one more, and I think, ma'am, you were, you were next. Hi, it's Stacey Way with Positive Return Training. The question is really for Mr. Stewart, but I'll take it from anyone. Good news is California has earmarked 68 million for the employment training panel, which is great. The bad news is they're spending it on a lot of out-of-state vendors instead of people that are here. We have a diversified trainer workforce, and we'd like to get more of that work. Is there a way for the government or your office to help them, help the local companies decide to use in-state vendors? Uh, so th that's, again, one of those things that comes down to political, uh, to political signals. Uh, so I think we need to understand better what, uh, what you're talking about. Uh, but we, we work with, with ETP or their price training panel uh, all the time. Um, so go ahead. $950,000 was granted as an award to Care Fusion local company. Care Fusion can hire, uh, I don't know exactly who they are hiring, okay, but I know their award. They're, they could spend 50% of that using out of state vendors. Is there, this is money that's coming from the unemployment tax that the sure. employers are charged. Is there a way to try to get them to use in-state vendors? Uh, good question. We'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to actually look at the CareFusion uh, model and see, see what, what all the rules are around the ETP. Uh, so again, it's a, it's a larger conversation, but I'm willing to have it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, I think, I think that's it. Uh, I, would, uh, I would close with a couple of quick things. I would encourage everybody uh, to uh, look at our uh, resources on entrepreneurship.org and Kaufman.org. There are a number of, um, a number of valuable uh, uh, references to programs and tools and, and whatnot on there. Uh, so a quick plug for that. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing you all again. The first planning meeting for the second annual Innovate SoCal conference is tomorrow morning. Is that right, Jesse? Um, so we'll see you all back here next year, um, but enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.